wonderful. Thank you, Zoom, for telling us that. Okay, so just uh, before we, we start, many of you may have seen this slide. The unconference um, wouldn't be possible if it wasn't from the support of all of these different organisations that are on the screen and the amazing um, hosts, people that have put up their hand to host conversations and the, the planning team that have been meeting for months um, to, to bring all of this together. So much gratitude to everybody um, who's been involved. So before we start um, our, our session this evening, um, and many of you will have been in sessions where, you know, various acknowledgements of country or karakias um, have been performed. So I'm going to do an acknowledgement of country um, before I hand over to Dee. So this evening, um, I'm coming to you from Tanarung land, part of the Kulin Nation here in Victoria, Australia. Um, and I wish to acknowledge over 65,000 years of custodianship of this land and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which each of you are dialing in from um, this evening or this morning or this afternoon, whatever time it might be in your time zone. I honour the spirit and wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia and recognise their strength, resilience, capacity and their cultural connection to this land and, and waterways of Australia. I commit to strengthening community with learning, culture, spirituality, and ensure that together we will connect and grow as one. The Yida Institute that myself, Dee and Fiona come from, acknowledge that the lands of Australia were never ceded. And as individuals in an organization, we commit to ongoing truth-telling, awareness and reconciliation. So thank you. And I believe now I'm handing over to you, Dee, is that correct? Yep, that's it. Um, to do I'll, a bit I'll, of a, a. Would you like me to stop sh sharing the screen? Yeah, I think so. Yep. Beautiful. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. <coughs> um, if we put in, I'll, I'll write it in the chat. Um, your name, where you're from. Oops. What time is it for you right now? And. Um, brought you here. So um, let's get a little bit of a, an idea. Um, we, we don't have time for all of us to kind of speak it, but please um, put in the chat and um, we might get a couple of people who um, are willing to, to read theirs out or speak it. So um, yeah, if you could put your name, where you're from, where are you or what's your time zone um, and, and why here? Why are you here at the Trauma Informed Community Building Session? Um, so while a couple of people put that in there, um, I'm happy to um, share myself and then I'll pass to Michelle and Fiona as a way of an introduction to your hosts here as well. Um, and then we'll get a couple of people to speak. So, um, yep, I'm Dee with the Eater Institute and um, <clears throat> where I'm from is Australia. Um, and... At the moment, I'm on the lands of the Jar Jar Wurrung people um, in the Kulin Nation, which is two hours north of Melbourne in um, Victoria, Australia. Um, it is 10 past seven in the evening for me. Um, so we're kind of looking down the barrel of the last evening of this unconference and going into the, the early morning. Um, and what brought me here around the, the trauma-informed community building um, it was a, a question that Michelle posed in a Facebook group just from something she'd read and put this random question in there and it went off with people responding and replying. And um, I was like, this is great. This, this is something we need to keep exploring this. And so we have. Um, so, yeah, that's me. So I'll hand to Fiona, who can then hand to Michelle. Thanks, Fiona. 
think do you want to do it the other way around fiona because it's being handed to you oh no no that's all right oh, yeah. go back to date. no you go you go fiona sorry <laughs> go fiona no go lucky we're not running an olympic race and passing the baton because we'd be just standing there having this conversation <laughs> um <laughs> so i'm fiona miller and I am very blessed to live on the banks of the Kanamaluka River, Palawa land, Lutruwita, Tasmania. So rock on Tasmania. I know there's a couple of others of you here. Um, and um, well, same time frame as East Coast of Australia. So about quarter past seven coming on to there. Why I'm here is a lot of the work I have always done revolves around people that may have experienced trauma or have seen trauma, um, going through trauma, um, and community building is something that is very, very powerful and passionate in one of my passions, and I see the assembly to it. So um, following like moths to a flame, you know, Michelle said this, Dee said this, I went, okay, I'm coming. Um, so came on the journey as well. So, um, but I think it's a really important thing that we remind people that trauma is around us and everywhere. And I like that we can share that and um, just have those conversations and maybe people will learn something um, while we're talking about this today, including myself because life is a journey of learning. So thank you, Michelle. Wonderful. And what a smooth baton change this one was. <laughs> um, so I, clearly I'm, I'm Michelle Dunscombe, as it says on the screen, living on, on Tunnarung land here um, in, in Melbourne. I'm about 60, 60 or 70 kilometres north of Melbourne as, as the the um, crow flies. I live up on a mountain range, so it's been a very cold and wet week for me. But why I'm here is, um, you know, trauma-informed community building and building our trauma-informed practice muscle is, is so important. You know, Fiona and I met many years ago when we were um, working in, in bushfire recovery, um, which you know, when you're working in disaster recovery spaces, like being able to work with a trauma-informed lens is so super important. But also mm -hmm. I do a lot of work with, with um, MOB, with Aboriginal community. Um, and, you know, we've, we have intergenerational trauma um, across our communities. So it's really important that we um, support ourselves as workers, but also other non-Indigenous workers that come into our space to be able to work in a trauma-informed way. Um, because as Fiona was saying, you know, trauma impacts everybody. And it's, you know, mm -hmm. when we look at Indigenous communities, it's it's multi-generational, it's intergenerational, it, you know. So we we carry the trauma of our, our of our four, um fathers and mothers so yeah so that's why i'm here i'm going to pass the piece back to d thank you and we'll hear who else is here thanks fiona and michelle would a couple of people like to speak um what they have written or even just what brought you here just to we'll get a couple of people get a bit of a sense of of who's in the room And don't be shy. Community builders always pretend they're shy when they're asked to speak. Like, come on. <laughs> I don't mind coming in, Dee. I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off and uh, get Thanks, things in. So uh, I'm Richard. I'm calling from Gloucestershire in the UK. Um, I work for an organisation called Knowledge Change Action, um, and we've provided a lot of trauma-informed training um, across mainly public service, that sort of thing. But I think increasingly within our organisation, we've been having more conversations about the power of community to, to help people co-regulate um, and get through periods of difficulty and challenge in their lives. And I think COVID has, has probably stimulated something in a, a, a fascinating way that if life was already difficult for you and you were dealing with personal trauma, putting a, a, a global pandemic on top of that has created an immense amount of damage and the subsequent impact has also been those people in professional roles are also dealing with tra with secondary trauma um compassion fatigue 
and moral injury as a result of all of those things that have been happening. So I've got lots of questions in here about how do we um, create places that are more compassionate, that are more caring, where people understand trauma and therefore are better able to support each other. That means that it doesn't rely on paid professionals, but it's about all of us being able to co-regulate as a, a culture in a community. So that's kind of why I'm here. I'm just curious about that conversation and um, like everyone else really trying to learn what does this mean for our practice and how do we further um, the agenda on this? Yeah, beautiful. Thanks, Rich. And and we're in conversation with Rich um, currently about what that can look like, you know, in this community building space, because um, it is something that we're exploring. So um, I hope no one's come here for all the answers because, you know, we want some from you too. Um, <laughs> but we do have some information to share and, you know, we can have a good conversation around that. Um, someone else want to give a bit of an overview why they're here? Rory, go for it. I, I will, yeah. So the thing I'm most interested in this is the my knowledge base and trauma informed stuff comes from some quite sort of practical interventions you can make in music making spaces to sort of to facilitate and not notice the sort of trauma regulation in people's bodies. You can't do that sort of stuff in something that's as organic as community building. You don't have those active, creative, sort of circular spaces where you can do that. So I'm just looking at how you can sort of broaden out that knowledge base to be applicable in more sort of organic situations. Mm, wonderful. Thanks, Rory. I teach a drumming program, a therapeutic drumming program. And one of the questions that we ask um, the young people who are in the circle is, um, drum, how are you feeling today? And, you know, if someone's just gone, that tells you a bucket load. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree. Embody it. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Hello, I'm Jo from Leeds. Um, <laughs> yeah. I live and work in the neighbourhood um, th that I'm in. And um, we have quite um, a reputation across the city as with lots of negatives. If people say, oh, I won't get a bus to there. And we have such a richness. And I just think it's so important that trauma does not define us as people or as communities. It's an experience that we go through. And I'm, I'm really here because I know I've, I've worked with you guys before and it's just about getting hold of that manure and getting the biggest rose bush going and planting it in the middle of it. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Beautiful. We love manure. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Who, who else? That's three from the UK. Like UK represent. Come on. <laughs> Who else? In fairness, what time is it there? Oh, is yeah, it the all morning? the way full of coffee? Yeah, yeah we're yeah, 10 a.m. Yeah, we're we sociable hours now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, enjoy they, that. They are <laughs> Marilyn, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I felt like I, um, I could say something. Um, sure. I've been thinking about... Um, the space of trauma and community development for a little while um, since, I, I guess, since COVID <laughs> first hit here. Um, and we did a big piece of work around looking at um, inequality, which is amplified through things like COVID. And then um, we had recently um, a, a terror um attack um in a supermarket in our community where um someone who had been radicalized had went in and stabbed a bunch of people um and it's relatively minor on the scale the scope of the world but i was thinking about we've got a whole lot of refugees coming into the country you've got a whole lot of people that are under pressure and there's a real space for community building to make sure that we are wrapping around this and actually diving into this space um so i guess that's really where my what's been marinating for me um in the last couple of weeks so this was a lovely a lovely little join up and where are you marilyn Oh, sorry, 
I'm in Auckland. And I just have to say, when COVID first hit, I did a bunch of um, webinars with you guys and that got me through the first one. So this was so nice because we're back in lockdown again. <laughs> <laughs> so it just feels like we're way back um back there so it's so nice it feels like coming home actually um Lovely. yeah thanks Marilyn bit full circle um yeah and and I think there's something in that in in what you said even though that might have kind of seemed to maybe the rest of the world a small blip what happened um or didn't even hear about it um, that in your neighbourhood, in your area, that that is um, hugely traumatic. Um, I was talking to another colleague uh, the other week about um, how my my concern around the the collective PTSD of the world and what that's going to mean for years to come for for us, for our parents, for our children. Um, it, it it's huge, and I, I don't even think we've seen the impact fully yet. Um, you know, it's it's still it's an unfolding thing. Um, so thank you, thank you all, and I think um, you know we're all in in good company here. And and as Rich said, you know, with with kindness and compassion, um, we will forge on. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Fiona, who's going to take you through the first little session. We are interactive. We've got a couple of breakout groups um, and we will uh, have some conversations with each other in there and also um, uh, together out in the larger room. So over to you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to have a look at what trauma-informed practice and trauma-informed care might look like. Um, so thank you, Michelle. Michelle's scaring, scaring the screen. Michelle's sharing the screen. Oh, the wording is not good. Um, so there's, there's five principles that we, we think about for trauma-informed care, um, and those are safety, choice, collaboration, trustworthiness, and empowerment. And if you can wrap them around what you're doing or in, embed them in everything that you're, you're working in, if we put them at the fore um, and ensure that the physical space and the emotional safety of people um, is addressed before anything else, um, you are providing some trauma-informed practice um, and that the individual knows that there's some trustworthiness there. Of course, there's relationship building that goes with everything as well. But these just give us something to start with. And they are a start. They're not an end. They're not the whole thing. They're just a start. If we can start with those principles and work towards that, that you know, that's something that we need to think about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I, I think it's really important that, Trauma-informed care understands and when you're thinking about it, it understands the nature of trauma uh, and it, it pro promotes environments of healing and welcomeness and recovery. It's not necessarily um, something that we want agencies or organisations or services or whatever they might be to, without even realising it, re-traumatise people. So that's thinking about that storytelling that you ask people to do all the time. It's thinking about where those partnerships might be within um, services and agencies that only one person has to hear a story, but you can share that or share that if you're working with the same people. If we can start to think more about those things rather than having a, um, you know, the gatekeeper on information uh, and having better services together, then we're not re-traumatising people without realising we're doing it. Um, and that's something that we found, especially in um, the bushfires, people having to tell their stories over and over and over again. Um, and while I was working in Victoria in, um, you know, in the early 90s, um, when we had the first Somali refugees come in, people, it just was horrible watching them do that over and over again, have to tell the story. So if we can think about, <clears throat> those times where we can just work together maybe we're going to remove some of that trauma and we know that trauma looks like different things and it, it does look like different things for different people um cycle the the actual definition of um what trauma is 
you know, trauma is a response to an event that a person finds highly stressful. Um, and we can joke about that in times when it's light and easy. And I might say I'm, I get stressful thinking about ironing. But that is something that is just, for me, it's it's one of those things. And we, think, we forget that if we're in conversation with people who are in deep trauma, we're actually saying their trauma, our trauma is bigger than their trauma. So, you know, how do you put them on the same page? How do you level those things off? Um, we know that really highly stressful events, natural disasters, accidents, war zones, they are <clears throat> they are quite traumatic and um, have long term all all have long term effects, um, and the effects of them can be experienced um, psychological. Um, there can be physical. Um, the emotional trauma that people have, you know, it's all different, but they're, they're different types of trauma that people experience. The, the different types of trauma, of course, are the, you know, we have acute, which is a result of a single or a one-off event. We have the chronic. Unfortunately, um, this is quite prevalent in our young people with family violence. You know, it's repeated and prolonged. It's exposure to... Um, <clears throat> highly stressful events that they might be seeing all the time, family violence, all of those things. Um, bullying at school, I mean, kids in schools and, and adults in schools and people with disabilities that get bullied, you know, that's where we're talking about chronic trauma. And then there's the complex trauma, which is where people are exposed to multiple types of traumatic events. And you've got that layering effect um, and it's just repeated and repeated. And we know that has an effect on the brain. And we know that the cortisol levels, you know, there's people who their cortisol level is so high all the time that when it's not up there, they don't know how to respond. So we, we know we have to have some sort of intervention as well. And not everybody needs medications, but some people do. Um, and there's something that I want to, I'm really big on and, it's also that secondary trauma, Rich pointed to it. It's the vicarious trauma that we live. And vicarious trauma, you sometimes at the time don't realise you realise that you're actually doing that or actually experiencing it. And that's when people um, develop symptoms of trauma who have been working closely with people that have had trauma um, and they're actually carrying the stories and slowly you're actually taking on that response of other people as well. And when we're doing that, um, it's often the first responders, it's health workers, um, all of those types of scenarios for us as, as community, community builders, community development workers, social workers, whatever you are, you, are ex you can be exposed to vicarious trauma all the time. So for me, that vicarious trauma is something that we need to be thinking about, which is where the self-care kicks in, because before we can actually provide spaces of trauma-informed care and embed trauma-informed practice, we have to understand it, how we're going to deal with it as well. Um, and, and sometimes that comes back to when we talk about the art of hosting things, but those processes that we know, that I use especially, is... Um, fourfold and how I host myself and the meditation and those walking and things like that. Um, we can, and Rory, you said about that, you in a smaller space and in an environment, you can look for triggers and, and see if people are showing signs. We don't always see that. Um, some people, it's a headache, it's, a, it's the funny tummy, it's the palpitations, people might sweat, um, they get the edging and jumping is something I noticed a lot in children and people who can't sit still. You know, that that's something you can notice. But if you are in a crowd of 100 people, how do you know there's that one person who's currently experiencing some trauma? So how do we make that space safe? And that's when we come back to those principles. As we, th we just think about the safety, we offer choices for people. That's having spaces and places for choice for people to be in. We work collaboratively, whether that's with our service providers or partners or whether it's community and understanding that and it's building the trustworthiness and it's that's the relationships as well. And it's also giving people who may be experiencing trauma the, the, 
the if they're in power to you to be able to move themselves around those spaces we're much better off by having um, trauma in care trauma informed practices and care in our community building um, and I think it's really important that we don't you know sometimes even language with people uh, we don't keep using things we don't label people oh that's the people with trauma that's the people down there they're the people who did this we need to take that language away from it and we we need to make sure that we're removing those things and um we don't know what people are experiencing right now here um as far as as far as you guys know you know my my shoe i said it today earlier i had a a a sweat a boot filled sweat experience one time where I was sweating so much my feet were wet and you none of you are probably you might not be aware of that right now so how do we do that even in these spaces online how do we provide that space and I think that's about the trustworthiness and the honest conversations and the transparency that we're talking about because um, we don't you know we we can see people withdrawal we don't know if people are feeling guilty. Um, depression, of course, we know there's there's some triggers with that that we go through. People might be feeling um, very, you go through the stages, you know, there's denial, anger, fear. We can often see sadness, but sometimes you can't. People might feel shame. We can't always see that unless people express things like hopelessness um, and that guilt how do we know? So we have to be more aware. We have to explore more opportunities and we have to um, give ourselves the time to acknowledge what we know and how we use our tools to help people in that space and build those nice spaces. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Um, do you want to um, take the screen share down, Michelle? Thank you. Um, so we're going to move into a, a breakout room um, and just have a bit of a discussion around that. Only like 10 minutes because we're going to build into the community building um, part of it. I'm going to leave the question there in the, the chat, but we've also got a jam board. So I'll just get the link for that. But the breakout question is, how might you adopt a trauma-informed practice? Or indeed, if you already have, um, how do you, you know, share that in your um, group? So um, just let me open the Jamboard and grab this link. That is not it. Hang on, sorry. Got it. All right. Um, so yeah, have a think about that. And Michelle's going to put you into some breakout rooms. You can start having a, a discussion. Um, I'll do it. <laughs> do what? Put them in the breakout rooms. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> can someone just check that jam board? I know there's been other people who are like, it's asking me to, for access and I have to request. Just let me know if it's open and you can get straight in. You're in? Good, good, good. All right, well, Fiona, Fiona's going to spin you out. Um, have 10 minutes and see you back here. I'm so used to Michelle doing it. <laughs> and you put me in a breakout room, Fiona? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, how, how did you go? And sorry about the couple of people with the breakout rooms got mucked up and left on their own and, and they <laughs> jumped back. And, yeah, anyway, I hope you all had a good conversation. Um, so let's hear from uh, a couple of people for about five minutes. Um, what, what did you talk about? What did you put up on the board? I'll pick on someone in a minute. I'll jump in if no one wants to. Thanks, so, Larry. So one of the cool things that um, we were talking about in our group um, was we had um, someone who was interested in trauma-informed practice in a school, um, working with a kindergarten to year 12, and someone who was 
looking at trauma-informed practice in terms of working within libraries to get more uh, people involved in libraries, more accessible library spaces, and then sort of notice that there's perhaps a sort of like a, a cross-pollination of trauma that interfects both those spaces. So if you have traumatic experiences in a school, then you're much less likely to want to take up the sort of gift and get involved in the gift of reading. And that sort of, uh, that that spoke to me a lot as someone who's like really dyslexic, but absolutely loves learning, but so we'll battle yeah. through it. But I only learned to do that outside of a school space, not within that sort of space. So there was an interesting thing that came up there. Yeah, nice one. And and I, I think that's part of, uh, can be part of a community builder's role. Um, I remember working with the community that the, the parents were very vocal about the fact that we put the kids on the school bus in the morning and they go for the day. Um, I'm not going to that school because I had such a bad experience at school myself. I'm not stepping foot in school grounds. Um, and so we did a whole lot of different projects and work and stuff to where I'd go and pick up a group of parents and take them to the school. And um, we did after school homework clubs and stuff, but kind of got them used to, you know, being there. And the principal came to their community and kicked the footy around with the kids. And but but that took a long time long time so yeah yeah there's a lot of um overlapping uh trauma there someone else in another room hello um am i on yeah yes hiya <laughs> So we talked about that, um, you know, that there's something, isn't there, about, you know, change moves at the speed of trust as well. Um, but also sometimes people aren't wanting to share their stories in a, a public space. It just is is about that coming together that is somewhere safe. Mm. And we just talked about how um, just being with people and having a drink or food that you recognise, you know, something that's safe yeah. easy you know you know what you're getting was, was something that we kept saying whether it was food or the nature of the space that you won't be asked questions you know the very very first steps are you know welcome sit down and, and beyond that nothing more is asked of you except you know that you absorb goodness and when you're ready you know and if mm. you're not ready see you again tomorrow another cheese toasty mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. that are was you strong with, in our group you were with stacy weren't you <laughs> yeah I was also saying though that after the Beast and Bombers we we invited people around for tea in somebody's house and we used to try and get eight different people around a table tea is what we call our evening meal here and yep. we just looked at having food that wasn't going to upset any of the different cultures or religions and stuff and so it were my job really and I just all I could come up with every night were jacket potatoes and salad and soup because trying to just make it so anybody could come through that door and everything on the table said to them, hello, love, get stuck in. You know, it's, it's important because you get the bottom line right and people will stay with you. That's lovely. Thank you, Joe. And yeah. and we all know um, here that Stacey's the um, cheese toasty queen. So that's how I knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, Karina, did I see you starting to talk, but you're on mute or were you talking to someone else? Did Yes. Did, did you have something you wanted to share before we move on? And you're still on mute? <laughs> you stuck Karina on mute? or Karina? Karina. Is there a Karina? Oh, yeah, that's all right. I'm, I'm off. Just thought I'd check. See ya. That, that's okay. Maybe she can't unmute. I, I was right. in Karina's group. I don't know. Um, I'm yes, Yannick. Yes. Hello, everyone. Sorry about my camera not working. Um, and Karina did make the notes for us. I can't see the, um, I need to go back to the notes, but I can see that some of them related to what we were saying. Lisa was in the group as well. And uh, was. I think one of these might be related to what Lisa was saying is we sometimes forget that people have complex and complicated lives when we're working with them in community development and we just take people at face value um, and um, you know you can't necessarily always plan um, um, I was talking about that I'm looking to work with peer mentors and um, train volunteer peer mentors with lived experience of 
um, homelessness and substance misuse, uh, to be working with our homeless community in, in, in uh, England, in Cambridgeshire, where I live. And, you know, the, the wanting to involve people and be very strength based, but also understanding that, um, you know, wanting to be trauma informed, that they will have experienced potentially trauma themselves that they might revisit in their volunteering, you know. Um, and so one of the things I'm hoping to do, you know, we're, we're very fortunate with our funding that we have access to a psychologist that will be doing super group supervision, reflective practice and things. Um, but also that I want to um, ideally share trauma informed care training with them as well. So they can have that understanding in their approach with others. Now, the trickiness of doing that is obviously that we can be fairly sure that a lot of them will have in, have experienced trauma. As Lisa correctly said, the fact is that quite possibly a, a, quite a lot of us have experienced some trauma, but the multiple trauma, the complex trauma, or, yeah. you know, that, that it, it would be quite high, um, usually um, statistically in a homeless uh, community um, and also then the substance misuse factor as well so mm -hmm. it's how we deliver that training and I'm looking at how to do that in a very sensitive way and I think it's just about being very open from the beginning with people about you know everyone's vulnerabilities and being vulnerable myself that doesn't mean oversharing but being vulnerable myself and making it as much as possible an equal playing field. That's why I like simple ideas, like someone just mentioned, like familiar food. I'm really anti any jargon, um, complicated forms, you know, simple to read slides and fonts and things like that. And lots of visual participative work. Yeah. So making people feel really at ease in, and being able to interact. And also, I want to build the team. I want to build a, a little bit of a community for them. Um, because then, as someone was saying about telling the stories, I, I feel they are going to need to tell their story, even if it, if it was a year ago, five years or 10 years ago. So acknowledging that and having a space for that for them. Thank you, Yannick. Um, now, I just want to note that one, Karina's is off mute. Ken's got his hand up. Marilyn just put hers up and we're going to have a five minute break in two minutes. So if the three of you can take like 30 seconds each, we'll have a five minute bio break. Karina. Oh, I was um, going to talk about um, from an Indigenous perspective, how we bring our own understandings, our own principles, because um, uh, the trauma we deal with is the one of colonialism and our language and our culture being taken from us and so it um, actually puts us in a deficit model and um, although when we go back to our um, indigenous practices uh, that's where we find our strength and often it's about um, when you're dealing with people of multicultural diversity it is about um, leveling the room. So not going in there with preconceived ideas and your language, as everybody said, but also understanding the different cultures that you're working with, because they also have sets of principles that they assign yeah. themselves to. And Joanne Harlan, thank you for mentioning Whakafanaunatanga, because those are one of the um, principles about relationship, trust, and um contributing sorry I went over 30 day <laughs> no thank you Karina I think that's it's a really important point really important um Ken you've got 30 seconds <laughs> try D um I want to just hats off to the uh, hats off to the organization because you're certainly practicing what you preach um in adopting a trauma informed practice I was I was in the group with Karen and Steph, and uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, a safe environment. Uh, for many years, I haven't spoken about a trauma that Karen asked me about, uh, asked if I had experienced one, and I actually spoke about it. The detail's not important, but what's important is that simply having spoken about it in a safe, uh, safe haven, a safe environment with two people that I I, I, I naturally uh, trusted, uh, I certainly feel much better. So thanks, Dee, that's all. 
Nice. Thank you, Ken. That's really lovely. Um, and Marilyn, I'm assuming you put your hand down. We'll come back. Yep. Cool. Thank you, everyone. That It's such a massive topic and we know we could do um, more with it. Um, but let's just have a little bit of a, a stretch and we'll come back with um, Michelle around the, the community building side of it. And I want to highly encourage you to stop looking at your screen for five minutes and come back on the hour. Um, so, yeah, take five minutes. Share, share the screen. So now we're going to move on and and um, look at um, trauma-informed community building. And um, I started on a bit of a journey a few months back, um, you know, as a result of some conversations that I'd had with, you know, with Fiona and the conversations I have with community um, around, you know, what could trauma-informed community building look like? And what are some of the, the things that we can um, share with, with community builders, community development workers, really, in fact, anybody that is working in a space of, um, you know, with, with trauma-informed communities. So I actually came across some work that was done um, by The Bridge in San Francisco. And they were working with, um, you know, people in public housing and 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 um, homelessness and and you know multiple layers of trauma, um, and I just found what they were saying um, really resonated with me. So they, through the work that they were doing, they um, they came up with some principles that you know create a process that that supports um, community development or community building initiatives. And, um, and it was interesting because some of this already resonated with some of the work that, that Dee and, and Dee, Fiona and I um, have been doing, and particularly the first principle there of, of do no harm. And we actually, Dee, later, later on um, in the session, will share our do no harm checklist because um, it's something that's always at the front of our mind when we're working with communities um, is to make sure that you're, you know, you understand that the people you're working with um, and communities that you're working with um, can be running at a high level of trauma, particularly if you're working in disaster recovery or, um, you know, like Karina was saying earlier, you know, if you're working with you know, Indigenous communities that have um, got, you know, generations of um, colonisation that has stolen language and taken children away and things like that. There's, a, there's you know, if you're coming in as a, as a service provider um, to over-serviced communities, that can re-traumatise. And particularly if we're asking people to tell their own stories over and over again and and um you know we don't create those safe spaces and and build relationships before you start you know digging in you know rather than um you know starting with here fill out fill out this form and tell us what you need it's actually starting to create those safe spaces where we have conversations and build relationships in the form you know if there is a form to be filled out and I would advise if there you know if you can avoid having forms to fill out that's all the better but don't bring the form out as the first conversation you know that's you know may it might be your second time you come together build a relationship first so that you can really start to live that do no harm principle the second one there is that acceptance and that's me you know um what the bridge talk about in, in that, that principle of acceptance is meeting people where they're at. Um, you know, so it's, I mean, it's a fundamental tenement of community development that, you know, you go to where the people are um, and connect with them that way in, in their spaces and places that they feel comfortable, you know, um, and accept the realities of the community, you, you are not there to fix people or fix the community. 
you've got to work within um, the, the realities of that community and be mindful of, of what that is and be mindful that, you know, traumatised people um, may say yes when in fact they mean no and things like that. So it's really about that um, deep listening and creating spaces where, where everybody's welcome. And that's so important when you're working in, you know, traumatised communities, um, whether it be after a, a, you know, after a natural disaster, after a man-made disaster, or in communities that have been impacted by, um, you know, colonization that, that really has, that has ongoing impacts for their life, that there's that sense that everybody's welcome and you don't just work with the easy people and, and um, those people that, that are always putting their hand up, making sure the spaces are open and welcoming to everyone. The third one challenges me a little bit because I have a bit of an issue around the word empowerment, but that's a story for another day. But you know, talking about um, what the bridge talk about here in that community empowerment space is recognizing the importance of self-determination. So that is, you know, communities having the agency to take their journey wherever they want. It's not, you know, having to beat to the drum of somebody else's um, agenda or somebody else's grant or funding application, whatever it means. Um, and encouraging that long-term community stewardship. So, and what they're talking about there is that, you know, again, building on that self-determination, that communities track their path and communities are the uh, are the experts in their community. So supporting that and building local capacity as a community builder, that might be your role. And your only role in that community is to be the cheerleader, the supporter, and helping the community build their local capacity. And then finally there, that reflective process. So the ongoing practices and, and allowing things to change in the community, knowing that, um, you know, in your reflective practice, thinking about how are you going to respond to the changes that are occurring in community? You know, and it may be as a result of some of the community building activities that are happening, um, or it might be as a result of, a, of another trauma. You know, and I think about some communities that Fiona and I have worked in recently is that they were hugely impacted by bushfires, then they had floods, then they had COVID, then they had floods, all within a period of 12 months. So there's multiple layers there. And so things have to change. You have to be able to adapt to what you're doing. So Dee, do you want to go to the next slide, please? So along with the principles, those four principles there, um, the bridge have developed some, some strategies. And I'm not going to go through all of those strategies, but it's certainly they're looking at individual, interpersonal and community, but also that those systems um, strategies, you know, around building those partnerships um, for long-term investment in community change so that it's not something that you're just, just popping in, for, you know, into this community for a few weeks, months, years or whatever, um, do to them and then walk away and leave a damaged community behind. So we need to think about those, you know, systematic um, environments that we're working in. So, um, and I'm just going to keep moving because what I was thinking is like doing all this exploration of the work that the bridge did um, and, and the reports that they've produced, I then started to think about how does this fit with ABCD values? And, you know, and, you know, what values can we see within those principles? And what else is missing? Like, is there something else that, that ABCD can contribute to um, trauma-informed community building principles that may take that next step. So I'm just gonna ask Dee to click on the next slide, which gives us a bit of an overview of the, um, the eight principle, or sorry, the eight values 
of ABCD. Um, and these were developed by the ABCD Institute. Um, and it's, you know, some of the things that we all know from, you know, the like, if you didn't know it before you started joining the Young Conference, you've probably heard a lot of these um, over the last, last you know, two days. Um, but, you know, that's starting with the gifts. You know, Eve, you know, and I wonder what does that look like in trauma-informed um, spaces, you know, and, and trauma-informed community building because it's quite often not the space we start with those communities, you know, because for, for a whole lot of reasons, there are judgments made that, you know, people with trauma don't have anything to offer and that we're there, you know, as the rescue or the saviour and things like that. But I still think there's a space for that. Um, building relationships for mutual support, you know, it's so important and, and building those relationships within communities that can sometimes become a little bit um, severed during time, you know, or, or fractured, sorry, during times of, um, you know, community disaster or, you know, uh, community trauma, whatever that might look like. Valuing the small, super important. And I see from a, from a trauma and um, informed perspective is that, you know, that, that's what we should be doing every day is valuing the small, it's those small steps and, and celebrating those with community. Nurturing citizen-led action certainly fits within the, um, you know, th those principles of um, talking about community empowerment where it's around self-determination and, and, and again, working for equity and justice Believing in possibility, you know, it's so super important for communities to um, have a sense that anything is possible. Even though we might be in the depths of deep shit at the moment, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Things are possible and we can move through those, um, you know, through that darkness as a community. Leading by stepping back, again, it fits within that... Um, you know, within, in my opinion, within those those principles. And of course, we spoke about including, um, including everybody. So whilst we've, you know, been exploring this um, over the last, last few months and having conversations, and like Rich said, um, when he was with us before he had to leave, we've been having conversations with him as well, so that we build up our um, you know, that, that trauma-informed community building muscle that we can then share with others, you know, and it's built on not only, you know, the reading or the theoretical side of things, but on our lived experience of, of experiencing trauma, um, working with trauma-impacted um, communities. Um, so what we wanted to do tonight is open up the conversation um, and we're going to send you out into to breakout rooms to have a have a um, 15 minute conversation with the group that you arrive in the room with um, and Dee's going to click on the slide so you can see what you're going to be having a conversation around those trauma-informed community building principles but thinking about where do you see some of the overlaps or alignments between the eight ABCD values that we just looked at and those four trauma-informed um, principles. And please don't stress if you're sitting there going, I'm going to be going to a breakout room and I can't remember the four and the eight. Um, so we'll pop them in the, um, in the chat so that um, when you go to your breakout room, um, you'll be able to see them. So, oh, and we've opened the breakout rooms already. So you're going to be flung out. I'll send them to you in the, in the breakout rooms. See you back here in 15. Um, would love to hear the feedback. So the bit of the conversation, I can see um, some of the stuff that's there on um, the jam board. Um, and I love somebody's put hope in big letters. And I, I love um, the acronym of hope that we use that came to us from, from St. Luke's um, here in Australia. 
but that helping other possibilities emerge is, you know, it's a way I love to think of hope in that really active space. So, but yes, please. And I'm um, maybe not going to be quite as gentle as D because I am I'm going to go around to each of the rooms. So um, Karina, Jess, Joe and Karen, would one of you like to share the conversation that you guys were having? Oh, Karina, unmute yourself, girlfriend. <laughs> Clearly tonight your, your computer's got a mind of its own. Yes. <laughs> There yeah, I was going to say, how about you, Jess? It's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I can, I can do a brief overview. Um, I, I think we kind of bounced around all of the different principles, and there's obviously so much um, overlap between these two value sets. So uh, we talked a little bit about time and how both uh, value sets need time um, to let um, the process unfold and to give time for trust to build. Trust was also kind of central to mm. the theme um, that we discussed and, uh, you know, those synergies between building relationships for mutual mutual support. That's very connected to the trust um, component mm. under some of those um, trauma-informed principles. And uh, there's no, no trust without um, building those relationships. Uh, and then yeah, we just kind of pieced pieced the rest of uh, them together and just kind of compared and contrasted what they were. So uh, leading leading by stepping back, um, allowing people the choice of of when they contribute. Um, mm. th that connects very well with the the principle of community and empowerment in trauma informed um, principles. Uh, we talked as well about how community empowerment means uh, inclusion in those spaces. Mm. Um, I can keep going, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> no. Thank you very much. Anything else from group one that anyone wants to add? And thank you thank to group you. one. That was a, a lovely conversation. Beautiful. Thanks, Jess. And thanks for sharing that back. I'm now going to go to group two, which was Katrina, Ken, Marilyn, and Rory. Would um, one of you like to, to share a bit of a, a bit of the essence of the conversation that you were having? I missed half the conversation, so I'm not the best person for this one. <laughs> Katrina, Marilyn, Ken, would one of you like to share? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll go um, to fill the silence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, so we talked um, a little bit around examples as well. So um, and, and experiences. Um, but for me, I kind of feel like we should be building a trauma informed practice, regardless of what we're doing because mm. we just actually don't know what people are turning up with. And if you do a street barbecue, chances are <laughs> there's going to be somebody on that street that is struggling with trauma. So it's not just when we step in two places. And that's part of, I see it as that starting with the gifts as well, is, um, yeah. Mm. Um, mm. So um, Rory talked a lot, uh, uh, talked about the um, the treatment of, or the tra the re-traumatization, I think, of um, migrants in the UK, particularly in the area that he um, is in, and um, talked a little bit about a previous, um, I've had a volunteer role that is working um, with victims of crime mm. and how a lot of those practices are all of these ones as well um, and those experiences. Sorry, that's kind of my summary. I'm not sure that it's a very good one. No, great. Thank, thanks for sharing. Um, and now we're going to pop over to the final um, group, which was... Steph, um, it was you and Miriam, and was Joe in with you guys? 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I've just rejoined. I got I don't know where I got. I think I fell off the table and into the bin. <laughs> <laughs> Great right to have, have you back, back, Joe. Back. That's all right. Um, Miriam is just, I'm assuming, Miriam, are you going to give the feedback for your group? Uh, yeah, sure, I don't mind. So, yeah, we kind of shared a bit of our experiences and how the two set of values overlap a lot. Um, uh, we talked about the importance of um, being transparent in building relationships. So not just there to listen, but also show you what you're, you're about because building relationships is always a two-way street. So mm -hmm. um, doing that, um, but also doing it and moving at a, a phrase Joe told us was moving at the speed of trust. Right, Joe, mm -hmm. am I saying that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and when people share their experiences to remember to thank them for it, because um, it could it be, you know, be really difficult for them to, to mm. do that. Um, and also not sort of giving your brilliant ideas of what people should be doing because your um, the experience is not about just you know, what they should be doing, but about reaching to a decision by themselves, it's also confidence and capacity building, which is mm. well, more than you know. Um, what you get at the end is the process. Um, what else do we talk about? Um, about libraries. I, I was speaking a little bit about libraries and how they often exclude, uh, you know, people in the communities who just don't see it as their spaces. Um, and how to bridge that gap using these principles. Um, is there anything else I missed, guys, Joe and Steph? <laughs> I, th Fantastic. I think we were just talking about the way they threaded through and, and wove together. And if, if you're ever at a point where you feel something isn't quite sort of generating authentic movement, check back your principles, always check back. And usually it's because mm. you're missing something or you're not offering something, mm. you know. Yeah, th thanks, Joe. And I think um, it's really important that, you know, trauma-informed community building isn't just the toolbox you take if you're going to a community that you already know has some form of trauma. I think, it, um, you know, great point there um, in that feedback is that, you know, all communities have got people that have Im been impacted by trauma. So if we use this as a natural way of working, then it doesn't matter where we're working. You know, if we're building those, creating those safe spaces and, and, and using those trauma-informed community building principles, but, and I, you know, my question is, are those four principles enough? Like, is there something else that ABCD can offer to those four principles? And I can see from some of the feedback um, that, there are some things, you know, um, certainly trust, you know, and, you know, so I'm gonna, we're, we're going to play around with this a little bit more um, and, and dig into, you know, because I, I see there's potentially um, a couple that are missing. And for me, what's really important is that, you know, culturally safe spaces and culturally appropriate, you know, um, processes and things like that I think there's a there's a bit of a cultural element and whether it's working with Aboriginal communities or refugee asylum seeker communities I think that's a little piece that's missing from from those four principles that the bridge have developed so now I am going to hand over to um to Dee who's going to sort of start to wrap us up with a little bow and we'll we'll do a check out. So over to you, Dee. I thought you forgot my name. You're like, I'm going to hand over to, um. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting a bit Hilarious. angry. <laughs> okay, so thank you everyone. And um, for those who can open it, apparently some can't in the little shares I'm putting in the chat. Um, there's a speed of trust and, and um, a build on relationships quote that I've added in there, which is actually the, the full quote. Um, so I'm going to share with you uh, on the screen 
um, a final idea, a final set of uh, um, kind of ideas, I guess, a checklist that Fiona, Michelle and I, um, we, we absolutely believe in these. Um, we, we wouldn't say that we developed them. Um, it's on the shoulders of giants we stand, uh, but they are ones that we certainly uh, believe in and, and really kind of live by. Um, so particularly the first one, like setting your intention and anyone who's done workshops with us would know we're very big on intention and purpose. Like, what are you doing it for? Like, we're really big on, on setting that, being really clear about that. Um, don't work alone. Um, we don't work alone. Very, very rarely would Fiona, Michelle or I work alone. Um, it would have to be extenuating circumstances and we would still grab a local champion, a person, a someone to say, come and do this with us. So um, yeah, don't work alone. Don't, don't hold all that uh, on, on your own. Um, use clear language. We know that uh, our sector is full of jargon. There's a whole bunch of stuff, like even mobilizing assets. Like, you know, what about let, let's um, get some action happening here? Okay, maybe not that, depends on the music. But um, yeah, just using really clear language about what, what it is that you're saying. Um, the go slow to go fast. Um, you know, sometimes it's, well, it's about time. You know, sometimes it's going to take much longer um, to, when you're setting your intention, developing your purpose, building that trust, you're going to take a lot of time, but it's so worth it because once that tipping point happens or that uh, the penny drops, however you want to put it, um, but when people have ownership and feel on board or, or they've got buy-in, whatever you want to name it, it goes quick. It, it can really happen quite quickly and, and then you can start moving. So that going slow, particularly um, with uh, trauma-informed um, practice, really important. Um, be transparent, be open and honest about what you're doing. Tell people what your intention and purpose is. Um, that's something that, that we're very big on, even in our organisation. Um, uh, I think we, we mentioned before, there's about 70 of, of us in the organisation and no hierarchy. Um, and so we have to be really honest with each other and be able to say, this is what's happened here and how can you help me with this? And, you know, it really is, it, it's like a, a big family. Sometimes we're like a bit of a dysfunctional family, but, but we're a family. Um, uh, leave the building. So um, as academics might call assertive outreach, um, but leave the building, get out of the building, go to where the people are, like Michelle was saying before. Um, be flexible, flexible, flexible. Always, always follow the energy of the community. Always go where they're leading you, even if it means, and I have done this even um, in a workshop where I, I had my pretty little agenda. This is many years ago before I worked with multiple people on my own, my pretty little agenda. I asked in a room of refugees and people seeking asylum as the check-in question, what brought you here? And I meant to the two hour meeting tonight. When I said, what brought you here? The check-in went for an hour and a half. I ripped up my paper, like laughing. I was like, let's just do this. Let's just get to know each other. It was fabulous. One of those best check-ins ever. So be flexible, follow the energy of the group. Um, and keep strengths focused, like as much as possible. Um, we know that, that this can take practice. You know, this constant reframing sometimes, you know, when people are feeling like um, they haven't got much to offer or they can't see uh, a way forward or they're feeling, you know, really overwhelmed. Like how do we keep strengths focused but still acknowledge where they are, you know, to be able to be there, be there alongside and, and, and be with, with a community or with a person um, in that time, but, but still maintaining that strengths focus. So we don't go down the, the needs path and start putting Band-Aids on stuff because no one needs Band-Aids. Well, okay, maybe some people do. Not like that. <laughs> so yeah, keep strength focus. Kind of keep that that eye on the, you know, the reframing. What else could it look like? 
So um, the only other thing that um, Michelle, Fiona and I have talked about that we would add here, and we're going to do a little bit more work like Michelle said, and also with your feedback is about cultural awareness. Um, so we will have, you know, we'll add something there and, and we'll keep digging into these. And um, like I, I've said at, at other sessions, and maybe not this one, that um, our, our little community building team in the Yida Institute, above all else, we are grassroots workers. So even though we do deliver trainings and workshops and all of that, um, the grassroots stuff is where it's at for us. We like getting our, you know, dirt under our fingernails and and we and and it keeps us us real. It keeps us honest and transparent as well. So um, you know, by keeping strengths focused, it's a practice. It's a daily practice that we have to constantly, you know, make sure our, our language is clear. What do we do? We talk to each other, have a bit of a debrief, whatever we need to do. So um, we're just about to check out, but I just wanted to, I'll stop sharing for a second. Are there any comments or questions about that checklist? Did everyone freeze? I appreciated the flexible, 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 flexible. <laughs> that definitely resonates. Yeah, cool, Rory. And just on that, Rory, it's interesting because we'll have a lot of organisations say to us, oh, but our funders won't let us be. Mm. And we say, have you actually even had that conversation with yeah. your funder? Because yeah, yeah. Funders, are, funders are focused on outcomes or some of them are outputs um, and they want to look good. So they want to get the best mm. out of the projects that they're funding. So go back and tell them. Well, that that's how I did a lot of my stuff as well. And luckily, they're very flexible, Leeds City Council, and how they're trying to do it. They're really trying to keep it as ABCD as possible. Obviously, there's limitations to that within, within the institution. But I just went out and did that and made sure that everyone could see the value that was happening and put the voices of the people we were doing out there. And then, then once they can see the value, people won't then turn back around and tell you to revert back to other practices. They just won't. You just, so yeah. ask forgiveness, yeah. not permission, is what I always say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's that's nothing wrong saying, with Rory. Challenge, challenging a system, you know, that, that's yeah. how change happens as well. So um, I've just put the checkout question in the chat there. Um, and maybe we'll just get a bit of um, feedback from, from each person who feels that, that they can talk, because I know there's a couple of people who um, have stepped away, but they're listening. So um, what might you do differently after this conversation, if anything? Uh, I may, maybe you won't. Maybe it'll be more reflection or um, discussion with others or something like that. But um, yeah, just, just as a checkout, um, we'll just speak when, whenever you feel like it. Um, what might you do differently now? <laughs> Fiona just discovered her computer mouse is on gaming mode. So anytime she slightly clicks it, it clicks everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I think I'm going to revisit some of these with my colleague because, um, you know, we were saying the other day about we get very busy doing the do. And yeah. um, I just think it is worth checking back because I know sometimes we've spoken about is anything changing for beasts? And is, is that, you know, you get your little moments, don't you? And I think mm. when I look back at these principles, I think, do you know what? Every day we go out we do go out with the right intention and we do have all that inside us. So it's kind of almost having the power of you guys behind us just saying, yep, you're doing right. It might look like a strange kind of job to everybody else, but it's good stuff. Crack on. Yeah. So yeah. thank you for that. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Crack on. <laughs> if it's Someone in your else? gut, if it's in your gut, you know you need to do it, Joe. If you, if it's thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Yeah. <laughs> Someone else, what might you do differently now? Katrina, yeah. yeah. Oh, look, I can say thank you. Um, I've learned heaps and reiterated a lot too to make me think, yeah, I'm on the right path with um, what I want to do. But, yeah, I can already see me changing my program of what I want to deliver. But the other thing is just some questions around don't do it alone. Um, so if I'm setting up a business and it's me, some mm. tips on how to not do it alone. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
split. Um, we can certainly, I'd love to have a chat with you about that, Katrina, another time we, yeah. we can talk about that. But like I said, if, if you yeah. find you're in a space where you are alone, um, who's the person who invited <clears throat> you into it? Maybe they can come and be yeah. your co-host or co-person. Um, like ha having those kind of deeper conversations with those around you who are also fully committed to it. Um, and, and you can kind of um, have them at your side as well. Yeah. And Katrina, I'll send you a message. Yeah. I'll send you a message. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Katrina. Anyone else for checkout? How are you feeling, Lisa? Oh. You feel a little bit better? I do. Can you see that my face starts looking like myself again? You look better. For context, I have, I have a really bad cold. So yesterday I was like this. <laughs> yeah thank you <laughs> you're welcome anyone else like to check out something you might do differently yeah I'll pick up the piece it's um more of a reflection than something that I would do differently although I guess it it is something I would do differently I I oftentimes when I uh am doing things um check in personally with an ABC lens and go like, hmm, was that really ABCD, uh, what I just did? Could I have, could I have framed that in a way that was more right. ABCD? Um, and I think what this session has given me is the opportunity to now also check in and say, was that trauma informed? Uh, could I be doing better? I think in, in all of these frameworks and tools and principles and, and value sets, um, the best thing that they offer us as individuals in our work is the, the choice to, to do them and to use them. And uh, I think D, like you said yesterday, it's like that big Nike check mark, just do it. Uh, and yeah. so on that principle, uh, the trauma-informed principle of ref reflective practice, um, I think what this session has given me is, is uh, a deeper understanding of what that reflective practice means for me uh, in, in actually checking in on whether or not I'm, I'm putting these principles into practice. So thank you uh, Fantastic. for leading this. Thanks, that? Jeff. Ken. My um, my take home is uh, a much more um, a much more defined, integrated uh, design process between the ABCD and the trauma informed um, principles, and uh, I really appreciate the input. Thank you. Great, thanks, Ken. And Lisa, you got your hand up there. Yes, for once I'm actually speaking. Ooh, I had to cut my camera. My internet is really bad today. I don't know why. Okay. Um, I, I think like what I wanted to say is I'm, I'm one of the people, as like some of you know, I'm one of the people who are supervising a team that is on the ground. So I, I, I am not on the ground myself, but I design and I evaluate and I reflect and all these things. And I think like just a thought in terms of like the supervisory aspect of, of the ABCD team is just this idea of checking in with your team. I do that all the time that like, for example, like we'll, you know, I, I, we have to build like rollout plans for how we're engaging. Um, I, at the moment, for example, we have like, we're in a specific area, we have 10 groups that we are working with and that we are going through different sessions. We have like the way we are doing, like we use the typical tools, but like in our own little process and all these things. And we space them out in a certain way and we have our rollout plan. But yesterday for like, we, we walk in, in Western Kenya and yesterday a boat capsized and some of the neighbors of the people with whom we are walking died in, in and drowned. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, they just like, they just called me up in the evening. They told me, they said like, we don't know yet what, how will next week will go, but we'll have to figure this out. And I said, yes, of course. So just like the appreciation for understanding dynamics that are there, but checking in with the people who know, because me, I wouldn't know. And it makes no sense for me now to say, but yeah, but the accountant is expecting the returns for the activity by next week, mm -hmm. which to some extent is my job, right? But like, we're not achieving anything in terms of the values we have. So there's no it doesn't make sense to push a timeline that is not sensible for the people we are working with and so again like also as this person like who's the gutter if you will like working between the institution and the team on the ground it's my job to ensure that they have the space and that they have their voice towards me to say how they think it needs to be done so that it's done properly because if it's not done properly we don't need to do it at all so yeah i think that's that's mm -hmm. what i'm thinking about i think we are doing that already but like listening to your session 
perhaps gave me more terms and gave me more concepts to reflect that. And I appreciate that deeply as always. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, you have to go and look at iCraft, like, just some incredible work there. Um, look, we're one minute over. Robin's probably in the orange room wondering where people are, if, uh, those who are going. So um, let's wrap up. And thank you so much for everyone who um, rocked up here. Um, and, and yeah, could continue on and, and watch this space because we're going to do more workshops around this um, in the future. Mm -hmm. And we're linking up with Rich in the UK and others in Sydney. And, yeah, so we'll um, keep an eye on our website and, and yeah get involved. We'd, we'd love to have you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. And Joe, did you just want to say something quickly as people are leaving? Oh, yeah, I just sorry. wanted to say, I, yeah, I've been unmuted for a while. I just wanted to say that I've never considered trauma-informed practice. My community has not obviously got trauma, like it's an affluent urban community, but this was a fascinating session. And like Jess said, just another huge set of tools to add into my kit here and something to think on and reflect on and practice. So thanks for your amazing Sorry, teaching Joe. and my, my yeah. group that I was in as well for being such wonderful teachers. Also. Excellent. I'm going to bed now. Thank you. <laughs> and for Thank those you. that aren't going to bed, jump over to the Orange Room now and join Robin and the um, amazing group of global women who are sharing great stories. Thanks all. Bye. I'll touch base with you. Corinna, we'll talk, we'll continue. Thank you, bye.